Hi, welcome to the Rock Pine Town YouTube channel. Today we're going to look at a Bible study that, that's called The Whole Armor of God. It's a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul from Rome to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus was in Asia Minor, which today is modern, modern day Turkey. The Ephesians is addressed, there were a group of believers who are indescribably rich in Jesus Christ, spiritually, but living a poor life because they are ignorant of, of their wealth in Him. And because they have not used it, they are walking like spiritual paupers. In chapters 1 through verse 3, Paul begins by describing a believer's heavenly bank account. Sounds good, eh? But it's talking about spirituality. It's about being adopted as, as sons or daughters of, of God. The acceptance, the redemption, the forgiveness, the wisdom, the inheritance we have got, the seal of the Holy Spirit, life, that's eternal life, grace, citizenship. In other words, every spiritual blessing that, that's been poured out on us. They can draw on this huge spiritual bank account, but they're seemingly not doing it. Chapters 4 through 6, it resembles like an orthopedic clinic where the believer learns a spiritual walk that's rooted in spiritual wealth. Looking at just a fraction of this letter, we will study the importance of a few yet crucial sentences that we can apply them to our own lives, our own walk in this troubling time. Now, it was written about 60 to 61 AD, that's approximately 30 years after the death of Jesus Christ. Over the next few weeks we are going to do a study on the whole armour of God with our foundation being in Ephesians 6. This will be an extensive study because in chapter 6 verse 11 Paul says you've got to put on the whole, in other words the full armour of God. So we start building a foundation and over the, the next few studies we will look at the armour piece by piece. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 and 11 we read, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the schemes of the devil. Wow. Now, that's take your stand against the, the wiles, the, the, the schemes, the, the, the craftiness of the devil. Paul says finally, which means he's winding down but we've got to put on the whole armor. Now, the first thing to understand is that Satan has been stripped of his authority. Yeah, we think he's all powerful and, and everything, but he's, he's been stripped of his authority. In Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus tells his followers that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Now, the word used for authority is the Greek word exousia, which means he's got the right, the liberty, the permission, the power. But Satan acts like he has the power. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, he says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Now, interesting, he prowls around like a roaring lion, but he's not one. He makes a lot of noise. He is our adversary or our accuser. He's trying to scare you and me. If, if Jesus has got all the power that we just read in Matthew 18, that, that Matthew 28, how much is left for the devil? None. Verse 11 says we've got to stand firm against the schemes, the wiles, the deceptive tactics of the devil. His trickery. He uses his trickery against you in your fears, by using false doubt, doctrine, by using your doubts, but he's all smoke and mirrors. All power was given to Jesus by the Father. Because it's been paid for in his blood. We've been bought, redeemed. In verse 10, it says the first thing, well, the first thing that we see in verse 10 is that the strength is from the Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord in his mighty power. Wow. So our strength doesn't come from our own ability to wear the armor or indeed even the ability to put the armor on. We've got to be strong in the Lord. The strength comes from being in the Lord, not because your armor is polished or whether you can swing the sword or you know how, how to hold the shield. Paul doesn't tell us those things. It doesn't come from our own ability. It doesn't come from, from anything that we do. Paul doesn't tell us how to use it. He starts telling us where our strength is. Our strength is in the Lord. 
Often in armor series teachings, we could easily get into works about how to keep it, how to clean it, how to put it on the right way. None of that is in Ephesians 6. We're not told how to put the shoes on or how to keep them tight. Now, when you've got the armor on, nothing changes from where your strength comes from. It's not from how good you are or how well you pray or how you can remember scriptures. Your strength only comes from Christ. There's no point getting a sword if you haven't got the strength to carry it or indeed wield it. I'm going to give you an example now from the Old Testament. And I want you to read this in your own time. It's from 1 Samuel chapter 17. And you read from verse 20 through to 51. Now I want to explain the story to you. It starts with this, this shepherd boy called David. Now I call him a boy, but he was actually a young man. And he was sent by his father to go to his brothers who were in the, the Israelite army. And he was, they were on the front line and they were standing on, on one uh, mountain and the Philistines were on the other. And in the valley, they, the, the, the Philistines had their champion. It was a man called Goliath. We've all heard this story. And David looked at them and he saw Goliath every morning and every night for 40 days. And he was actually mocking the God of Abraham, Jacob and Isaac. Now, because of this, David says, no, 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 I'm going to challenge this guy. Word got to King Saul, and Saul had a word with David, and, and he, Saul says, look, you know, he was a bit skeptical. He says, look, I'm going to give you my armor to wear. Now, we often get the impression that the armor was too big for David, but the Bible doesn't say that. Probably the armor fitted perfectly. But the secret of knowing about the armor comes in verse 39. The Hebrew word ya'al, our Bibles have translated it, he tried to walk. But it's actually more accurate to say he was not willing to walk with the armor on. So why? We ask this question, why was he not willing? Well, the answer is in the, in the last part of the same verse. The Hebrew word nacha, which means he hadn't tested it or proved that it works for him. So he opted what he knew had worked for him in the past. And that was the simple slingshot. Now, when David confronted the enemy, when he confronted Goliath, he didn't brag about the slingshot and the pebbles, but he did mention what Goliath had. He said, you've got a sword and you've got a spear. He says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. That's in verse 45. David didn't put his faith in the armor. And so our lesson will continue from the Old Testament into the New Testament, because if we trust in our own abilities, in our own stuff, for example, everything that we can do, we can let ourselves down. But Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We find that in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. So we have to rest in Him and let Him be our armor. If we trust in our own ability, we will undoubtedly get tangled up in the tricks and the lies and the schemes. Of the devil. I want to read you an example of how we can get fooled in Luke chapter 11 verse 21 and 22. And here we see that Jesus is, is talking to the people. In verse 21 and 22 we read Jesus says to them, and when a strong man fully armed, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man's trusted and he divides up the plunder. Now, we often think because of verse 23, which says, whoever, this carries on, Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So we get the impression that we are the strong men with the armor and, and we are guarding our own possessions and it's all to do with our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, actually, it's not like that. That's incorrect. It's the interpretation because if you read from verse 14, Jesus is talking about a house or a kingdom that is divided. You see, when he had cast a demon out, they said that he had done it in the name of Beelzebul. Now, that's the devil. Jesus says in verse 20, no, no, no. He says, I've cast it out by the, the, out the demon by the finger of God. Jesus was putting a parallel 
to when Moses was in Egypt and he threw his rod down and the, the Pharaoh's magicians, they threw their rod, rod down. And what actually happened was that Moses' rod actually ate up the, 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 the snakes of the, other, of the other magicians. So he's now putting, Jesus is putting now back this to his accusers that they're going to have to change their opinions about him. Verses 21, 22 about the strong man. The strong man is actually Satan. For he has got the unbelievers where he wants them. But Jesus is the one who is stronger than he. And he comes along. And verse 22, the Bible tells us that the strong man relies on his armor. Now as believers, we don't trust in our armor, but in our Savior. In Ephesians 6, 10, again we come back, be strong in the Lord and in his strength and in his might. So we are in Christ and he is in us. So if you're trusting in your armor, in your own abilities, you're following the lead from the devil, for he trusted in his. Interesting enough, in this illustration, Christ divides the spoils of war out. To us, the spoils of war of Christ's battle was eternal life. We get the spoils of war and we didn't even participate in the battle. I'm going to give you another example. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, you've got to read the whole chapter to get the, the, the whole story. But I'm going to give you a, 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 a summary of it, a summary of the whole thing. I'll explain the story to you. David has got an army and he goes away and he comes back to his village in the Negev desert, south of Jerusalem. There are 600 men. And when they see that their village has been plundered by the Amalekites, uh, the men get, get angry. Their wives have been taken away. Their stock has been taken away. All their possessions have been taken away. And they turn against David. David then goes to the high priest and, and he hears from a word from God. And he wants to know what should he do? Should he pursue after these people or what? Or should he just, just face the music? He gets a word from the Lord and the Lord says, you've got to go after them and you will pursue them and you will catch them. So David goes. He goes after these, these men. He takes his army with them. But when they're, they're going for a few days in the desert, they come to a, a, a valley and there's a river flowing through the valley. And out of the four, 600 men, 200 of them, they're tired. They said, we can't go on. We just can't go on any further. So David says, well, you guys rest here. I'm going to take the rest of the army and we're going to pursue these guys. So he takes the 400 and he goes and he finds an Egyptian slave who used to be a slave for the Amalekites. Because he got sick, they left him behind. He said he will take them to where they are. So David and his 400 men, they go and they pursue and they conquer and they not only get their own possessions back and all their wives back again, but they actually, they, they, they get the plunder that they, these guys have taken from other places. Now, when they went back to the, to, the, to the river and they found the 200 there, some of the 400 men said, now hold on a second, why should they, they, why should they get the rewards of us? We actually went there, we risked our lives, we we're the ones that did the fighting, we we're the ones that did the plundering, we we're the ones that, that captured everything. Why should we share it with them? And David said, it doesn't work like that, guys. These 200 are part of us, they're part of the team. So what we're going to do, we're going to give them back what, what was taken from them and we're going to share the rewards out with them equally as well. Now, in this picture, Jesus is our heavenly David. You may be tired and burnt out as a Christian, but you don't lose out on the spoils of battle. And Jesus is still stripping Satan of his spoils, but every person who becomes a believer it's one less for Satan. So in the Old Testament, the armor was always a symbol of strength and power, but it was only affordable to the elite, to the rich. So when we put on the whole armor of God, we are, we are privileged to be a child and an heir of God. Putting on the whole armor of God is actually listed in Strong's Word Study. And what it says in the Word Study, it says... The, the Roman armor was the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the shield, the helmet, the sword, and the spear. This was their armor. However, the list that Paul puts in his letter to the church at Ephesus, one item is deleted, and that item is a spear. Now the question is, why would he leave the spear out? Well, 
The only there, there are two wep offensive weapons in the Roman uh, uh, armor. It, it's, one is the sword, and the other one is, in fact, the spear. But the spear was left out. The rest are defensive weapons. You see, the spear is something that is thrown at the enemy. As God's people, we do not throw anything at anybody. Example in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 11, David is what a great musician. And, and he w was playing his harp and, and he was walking around and he was playing it for King Saul. But King Saul had a spirit, the Bible tells us, uh, of depression, of anger. And it, really it was a spirit of jealousy. He was, he was jealous of David because the Spirit of God had left King Saul and David, he was the one that was being anointed. He had the whole spirit upon him. So what he did was he picked up a spear and he, it's, the Bible says that he tried to actually pin him against, against the wall. Well, he didn't. Thank God for that. So we don't do anything. We don't throw things at people. We don't throw the armor of God. We don't throw the word of God at someone. We will share it with them. Now we look at law and grace. And the Bible tells us that the law was given to Moses. Remember on the top of Mount Sinai? He was, the law was given to Moses and he actually carried it down to the Israelites, to the children of Israel, to the Hebrews. So he got the law from God and he went down with it. But grace comes by Jesus Christ. Emmanuel. Now Emmanuel means God with us. In John chapter 1 verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He's with us. So Paul says we must put on the whole armor of God and not the whole armor of the Roman soldier. Now verse 11 tells us to stand firm. Verse 13 tells us why. In the next study we will look at why we will take it that little bit further so until then i just want to say to everybody god bless and shalom and keep well and keep safe bye for now